Muscle contraction at the microscopic level is going to be very similar to the muscle contraction at the organ level. So again, since sarcomeres have to shorten, which we I briefly discussed in the previous notes, you have this shortening, this means you're going to lead to an actual shortening of the organ. And so because it produces a shortening of the organ, we have to overcome that tension, we have to And so because of that pulling on the bones by the fascia and as the muscle itself shortens, we produce movement. So the microscopic shortening produces the macroscopic flexing, extending, etc. This means that our amount of tension is based on the number of fibers stimulated. Again, this goes back to the idea of recruitment and motor units and the frequency of the stimulation. In other words, if you have a constant barrage of nervous stimulation at a neuromuscular junction, even though the acetylcholinesterase is breaking down the acetylcholine, we if we have a constant presence of acetylcholine, the microscopic changes within the cell keep the calcium released and keep the active sites available for cross bridge formation to occur and we keep contraction going. And the second component is then the availability of energy. Again, we alluded to that with the sheer magnitude of the amount of energy required because every single myosin head requires a minimum of two ATPs. We know every single sodium potassium pump has a requirement of one ATP. So again, huge energy hogs. Now what we see then, what is produced, are different types of not contractions so much as different types of fibers capable of different types of contractions. What we know as fast or slow twitch fibers. And in essence, when you look at somebody's with all the muscles, etc., these are more of the fast twitch, that explosive speed, the quick sprinting ability is typically associated with the fast glycolytic fibers. In other words, that quick burst of energy, lots of strong contractions, power strokes. Slower oxidative fibers rely more on an anaerobic, uh, I mean an aerobic pathway, lots of oxygen, and you literally see the difference in they're stringy compared to the massiveness here, and they simply utilize more of an oxidative pathway as opposed to a glycolytic one. Now, even though we have two types of fibers, we still have basic contraction, the basic contraction model. We have that shortening. Now, there are actually two types of contractions based on what we're doing, and you can actually simulate this. If you lift a book, bring a book up, put a book in your hand, and bring it up and hold it, okay, the shortening of your bicep as you bring up the book is going to be isotonic. We decrease the muscle length, okay? Whoops, can't go straight, can I? So when I decrease the muscle length, I change the length, the tension inside the muscle is maintained it stays constant, hence isotonic. Now, if you were to hold the book at 90 degrees, keep your elbow at 90 degrees, and then stack two or three more on it, the length of the muscle doesn't change. So the muscle stays the same length, but now the tension on the muscle is increased. This is isometric. We see these most commonly in the basic functions of the muscle muscular system to begin with. And that is what we typically think of as the role of the muscular system, which is movement, the actual change in position that we're used to seeing, but then we don't but then posture is the other one. That's where we see isometric. So a lot of our back muscles, the posterior muscle muscles that are responsible for our posture, um, the core, the abdominal muscles as we change positions and their ability to kind of hold us in place, those are all based on isometric contractions. Now, the last thing I want to talk about related to this is this idea of muscle tone. So remember that motor units are spread throughout a muscle, that it takes multiple motor units to produce the overall change in the muscle. In other words, I have to have multiple motor units contract to produce the overall change in movement that I associate with muscle contraction. Asynchronous contraction is when I may have one motor unit fire 
and then another motor unit fire, and then another motor unit fire, none at the same time. There's no coordinated effort. There's no coordination of contraction. And so without that coordination, we have the burning of the muscle. The muscle is burning energy. It's contracting, but we see no overall change in contraction. And this is what we typically associate with muscle tone. So somebody that seems to have muscles, that's literally what you're seeing, is you're seeing this resting tension, this constant contraction. And that's why if you have a higher body mass index associated with muscle mass, you tend to burn more calories sitting still than somebody who has lower body mass of muscle mass than just sitting there because your muscles are actually contracting while you sit and that's why you burn more energy. Now when we look at an actual muscle twitch I want you to notice the similarity between this and our action potential. And what happens is I see the changes in the permeability of the membranes I see the contraction and then I see the relaxation. When we talk about a muscle twitch, one of the things you want to remember is that it's a single brief contraction, not necessarily what we consider normal muscle function. Normal muscle function is actually related to this idea of a fused. In other words, I have a constant stimulus. As mentioned earlier, if as long as acetylcholine is present and binding to the sarcolemma, we maintain a constant release of calcium ions. The presence of the calcium ions keeps the tropin and tropomyosin protein complex out of the way, keeping the actin and myosin binding sites available so that cross bridge formation will occur, contraction will occur. So this is actually what happens when we talk about a contraction. This unfused and summing is every now and then when you have that herky-jerky movement, you've got some of this going on. And if we didn't have this fusing of the contractions, you wouldn't see the smooth movement. It would, it would literally look like if you've ever watched um, the robots or anything like that on TV, you see this herky-jerky movement associated with their movement. It's very jerky. You, know, you have this very robotic movement. So without the fusing, that's what we would see in our own. So you want to notice then, since I said I said they were similar, right? You can see here's my action potential. My I hit threshold, I have all or none. Well, the same thing happens with muscle. I have a threshold, all or none. And so I see the membrane potential change. That change in the membrane potential is what leads to contraction. Contraction in muscle is always all or nothing. So just like I have that threshold required for the action potential within the membrane, if the sarcolemma has an action potential, I'm going to produce a contraction within that motor unit, within that muscle fiber. And so we have a change of permeability. I'm going to get all of those steps that lead to contraction, like this chemical cascade that produces, and I get contraction, and then I get relaxation. Relaxation only occurs with the removal of the acetylcholine back at the binding sites within the actin on the motor end plate. So as long as acetylcholine is present, okay, I see this fusing, okay, I see this increase, this grating that occurs with the muscle contraction, I get a very smooth movement, and as soon as the acetylcholine is removed, I see this relaxation. That's basic muscle contraction.